Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm with SACS Healthcare Communications. I'd like to show our attendees today on how to ask questions, which our speaker will answer as many as possible at the end of the webinar. Please type your questions directly into the questions box. Our moderator for today is Christina Davis. Christina is currently an adjunct professor at the University of United States in San Diego, California and Aspen, Colorado in Denver, Colorado. Christina has an extensive background in GI digestive disorders in both the treatment and diagnosis of GI disorders. Her background includes clinical research through the NIH and FDA on infection related topics. Christina, welcome. Good morning and good afternoon. Um, thank you, Tracy, for that very kind introduction. Uh, the title of today's webinar is Foundations and Innovations in the Field of Endoscopic Ultrasound. Speaking today on this new and exciting topic is a leading innovator in the field, Dr. Neil Sharma. Dr. Sharma has served as the founder and director of Advanced Endoscopic Oncology Programs at Parkview Cancer Center. Um, Institute, I apologize. Under his leadership, uh, Parkview currently performs greater than 2,000 EUSs, greater than 900 ERCPs, and is a regional leader in the endoscopic mucosal resection, ablation, and submucosal dissection. He has served on faculty at Indiana University School of Medicine. Dr. Sharma also currently serves as the chair of GI Oncology Program and the president of Parkview Cancer Institute. Um, and the speaker has disclosed the following uh, relationships, um, consultant, Boston Scientific, Steris, Medtronic, um, Steris, Endoscopy Now, um, State Board, American Cancer Society, um, and the opinions expressed are the personal opinions of the speaker and do not reflect the opinions of um, our sponsor or SACS Healthcare Communications. Um, in order to obtain, obtain your continuing education, um, a link will be available at the end of the webinar, and this activity has been approved for one AMA category uh, one credit, um, and the accreditation statement is below. And um, again, uh, for nurses, a link to obtain your certificate will be available at the end of the webinar. Um, it, this has been approved for one contact hour for nurses. Um, the accreditation statement is below, and um, support for this activity has been provided by Medtronic. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Sharma. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. I hope everyone can hear me and uh, welcome to the lecture. We're going to take you through some exciting innovations and the foundation of endoscopic ultrasound, a field that is uh, very close to my own heart. Uh, it's a field that's rapidly advancing in the realm of endoscopy. And I think you'll be very excited to hear everything from the basics all the way out to some of the latest and greatest in terms of the innovations that we're performing in this field to better care for patients. So our learning objectives today. We're gonna to discuss EUS technology and its applications. We're gonna describe the differences between endoscopic ultrasound fine needle aspiration and endoscopic ultrasound fine needle biopsy. And then finally, we're gonna discuss some of the novel frontiers in therapeutic endoscopic ultrasound, such as endohepatology, EUS guided biliary bypass, EUS guided lumen opposition, EUS guided fiducials, and EUS guided ablation. We won't have time to get through all of these, but we will have the opportunity for you to ask questions or even contact me directly for some interesting videos uh, related to some of these novel therapeutics. So a little bit of background, Advanced Interventional Endoscopy is an additional one to two year fellowship after GI fellowship. It has variable emphasis in its training, has its own ASG sponsored match. I went through a similar program at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And during that program, we learned things such as advanced DRCP, endoscopic ultrasound diagnostics and staging of tumors, US guided interventions that you may hear mentioned today. Also endoscopic resections of large polyps and early tumors, management and radiofrequency ablation of Barrett's, ESD, which is third space endoscopic submucosal dissection and POEM, as well as endobariatrics. But there's really a great opportunity in this advanced fellowship to focus in on EUS staging of cancers, including the esophagus rectum, uh, stomach, gastrointestinal stromal tumors, the pancreas, gallbladder, and cholangiocarcinomas. carcinomas. You'll hear about some of this focus training and how we stage these tumors today. Additionally, we have time during that fellowship to focus in on endoscopic ultrasound guided interventions. 
There are a plethora of US guided interventions, some of which will be mentioned at the end of this lecture, but they include and are not limited to celiac neurolysis, pseudocyst drainage, pelvic abscess drainage, US guided biliary drainage, US guided ablation, US guided lumen opposing stents. Endoscopic oncology is also a big part of my personal practice and a focus of many interventional endoscopists. We're able with EUS and other technologies in endoscopy, perform tissue acquisition and give an accurate diagnosis on cancers. Additionally, perform complementary staging to what radiologists may see in cross-sectional imaging, sometimes more detail enhanced. Who we'll also then present cases at tumor board, perform a variety of therapies and interventions on cancers, as well as palliative procedures. So we'll jump into the first of three segments of this lecture. We're gonna give a background and an overview on endoscopic ultrasound technology and its applications. So what is endoscopic ultrasound? The way I describe it to uh, other specialists as well as to patients, endoscopy meets radiology. So we're taking a scope that goes down through a patient's mouth in the case of upper endoscopy or occasionally uh, through the rectum in the case of lower rectal cancer staging. Predominantly, US is done in the upper GI tract. And when we pass the scope down through the mouth, it's different than a standard upper endoscope. It does have a camera, though the camera is often, for the case of linear scopes, at 45 degree angle um, or at uh, a different angle altogether for radial scopes. And rather than using just the endoscopic camera, we often will deflate all the air out of the lumen and use ultrasound to look at the details of the wall structure of a given organ or to look through one organ to view other organs adjacent. So really, it's not looking inside the lumen like standard endoscopy. It's looking at the wall or through the wall of organs in order to get better detailed imaging of adjacent structures. We then can perform tissue biopsy and tissue acquisition. We can perform staging of cancers, including good definition around the vasculature of a particular tumor and what vessels it may be invading. And then finally, and most importantly now, we do a variety of therapeutic interventions using a linear echo endoscope. And I'll give you an example of that. It's important during the training to understand the principles of ultrasound and to be able to visualize anatomy. You're getting 2D images when you do EUS, but we often will pair these up with what we know of the human anatomy, as well as taking a look at other cross-sectional imaging, such as CT or MRI to visualize the space in three dimensions. And that's what makes an endosonographer proficient at their craft. So the principles of endoscopic ultrasound, you know, we use ultrasound-based energy, which is the mechanical energy that has vib vibrations. It propagates through mediums such as tissue. It does not like to travel through air. So we will not insufflate an organ. We'll actually deflate an organ, or we'll put a balloon filled with water around the transducer of a scope and that allows for the ultrasound waves to pass forward. As it interacts with tissue, there will be a series of uh, reactions that happen. As the tissue absorbs the ultrasound wave, it refracts or sends it in different directions and scatters it, or it reflects it back to the transducer, which then takes back the ultrasound waves and creates an electronic image, which we then see in real time. It's important to understand that there are a variety of artifacts. EUS imaging and EUS altogether is very much operator dependent. So while there's very high sensitivities and specificities, even when compared to things like CT and MRI for high detailed imaging, uh, at the same time, there is a sense of operator dependency and there's a big learning curve to this type of technology. Here's a great example of how we're shooting ultrasound waves out from the transducer and how we can change those waves. So as the wave frequency increases, the depth of penetration goes down. As the wave frequency decreases, the, the depth of penetration is changed as well. And here's a picture that actually shows what happens to those sound waves. So as they go forward, they hit an object. As they hit the object, it will either refract, pass through, get absorbed, or go back to the transducer, which then generates the electronic imaging. Additionally, what's interesting about endoscopic ultrasound is we have the ability to use Doppler technology. The Doppler technology allows us to see in real time vasculature that may be surrounding either the tract in which we hope to perform an intervention or a tumor where which we're trying to stage appropriately to see if it's potentially resectable. 
There's two basic types of echo endoscopes that are used throughout the world today. One is the radial echo endoscope, and it creates uh, an image very similar to a CT scan. And you can see here the transducer is wrapped around the head of the scope in 360 degrees. The other type is actually a linear or cone down uh, echo endoscope and it has a cone down view. And that type of scope actually allows for the passage of, of needles or other catheters or a variety of other tools to perform interventions. Here's another look at what happens with radial imaging. So as you can see, the transducer is wrapped around, ultrasound waves are sent at 360 degrees, then brought back to the transducer, creating an image very similar to a CT scan. As you can see here, which was mentioned before, there's a balloon that surrounds the radial transducer and it's filled with water. That way that ultrasound can be transmitted. We actually suction down the lumen so you don't really have much of an endoscopic view at all. All of the view is completely on ultrasound. So it's important to have a great grasp of ultrasound imaging and his interpretation. This is the linear echo endoscope. As you can see, it can be used with or without a balloon. In our practice, we typically do not use a balloon. Uh, once you get proficient without using a balloon, it saves some time and also some of the cost of the balloons. As you can see here with the linear scope, not only do you do imaging, but then there's a large channel which allows for the passage of devices, such as in this case, a biopsy needle. Finally, a third type that I still use sometimes in my practice is a mini probe. It can go through a standard scope. It has a very high frequency, usually ranging between 12 to 20 megahertz, and it allows for a really coned in view. Here you can see one that can be passed actually uh, up the bile duct and create images of the bile duct for staging of cholangiocarcinoma or bile duct strictures. Uh, this is often used sometimes in the colon as well, because we cannot able to get a radial scope or a linear scope all the way over to the right side of the colon. Um, but again, there's limited use uh, of endoscopic ultrasound in the colon relative to the upper GI tract where it's much more commonly used. We also like to use this for subepithelial lesions, uh, particularly in the esophagus. One thing that's often overlooked nowadays in endoscopic ultrasound is the utilization of EUS within the mediastinum. As pulmonology has increased their utilization of endobronchial ultrasound, we've seen some regression in endoscopic ultrasound for staging the mediastinum. In our large tertiary cancer institute, we have a great opportunity to work closely with our pulmonology colleagues. And when we do so, we do often will do some core biopsies or other interventions in the mediastinum. The core biopsies are particularly valuable for items such as uh, the staging of lymph nodes or lymphadenopathy or lymphomas. It also is helpful reaching some of the stations that cannot be reached by EBUS, stations that are perhaps uh, distant to or distal to uh, the subcarinal space, such as the aortopulmonary window. And in doing so, we can combine with endoscopic endobronchial ultrasound to create complete what's called medical mediastinal staging. And so here you can see EUSFNA endobronchial ultrasound TBNA transbronchial uh, aspiration. You can see all the different stations that can be reached. In particular, the AP window is easy to be reached uh, here by EUS. Um, Around the paratracheal region, particularly to the right, it's better for EBUS. Another one that's important to mention is that the subcranial space can be reached by both. So if we need very large core biopsies, it's difficult sometimes to do that with the EBUS scope, which is much more slim and narrow. So sometimes they'll ask us to get core biopsies, particularly for staging things like B-cell lymphoma or uh, perhaps a sarcoma that needs some tissue diagnosis, or particularly for looking for molecular markers, which we'll mention later on the value of endobronchial uh, ultrasound or endobronchial biopsies. And here's a staging algorithm. This actual staging algorithm comes out from a, a book by Rob Hawes called Endosonography. It's actually pulled from some data that was developed through Mayo Clinic. And if you take a look here, uh, this is a staging algorithm specifically to non-small cell lung cancers. You can see you do a PET scan, then the role for EUS or EBUS, and then followed by potentially mediastinoscopy, which is significantly dropped off by the addition of EUS to EBUS for complete medical mediastinal staging. And here's an example of biopsy of a mediastinal mass with EUS. In EUS, when we do a linear EUS, particularly pancreatic or biliary EUS, it's important to recognize that we have stations. So when we get distal to the, uh, to the esophagus and we go below the crew of the diaphragm, which separates the lungs from the abdomen, you can see we reach station one. So station one's right at the GE junction. From station one, we can see uh, the gastric artery, gastric vein. We can also image some of the, the left lobe of the liver. We can still image some of the heart. It's a great place to biopsy uh, gastrohepatic lymph nodes. So that's a common station uh, which can have some lymph node metastasis. In this past week, I've 
done a couple of biopsies in that location for uh, staging for stage four for tumors that were otherwise um, unknown to have a finalized stage. So it's a great station for that. Also between stages one and two, we get a better look um, at the left kidney. We get a good look at the spleen. We often will get a look at the left adrenal gland. We'll then comb downwards. As we comb downwards, we get a good tail look at the tail of the pancreas back here, as well as we moving further down station uh, two and we get a good look at the body of the pancreas and the neck of the pancreas, all of which can be seen between stations one, two, three. Even in this location, we get some views of the head and the common bile duct, but they're much more better visualized uh, down here in station three, which is the bulb. So the bulb of the duodenum is the best place to visualize the head of the pancreas, the common bile duct, the common hepatic duct, you can also visualize the gallbladder, both from stations one, stations three, uh, and even the distal part of the station two. And then as we go take this echo endoscope further down, we go to the area of the ampulla, and we visualize through D2 and D3, second and third portions of the duodenum. We can get a good look at the aortal cable sections. Um, we can also take a look at the right kidney. Occasionally, we can see the right adrenal gland if there's metastasis and there's hypertrophy. We can take a look at the base and right side of the liver. Um, and then get a better look at the unstate and ambulatory regions. So we get quite a few views that you can see by combing through um, the stomach, going down through the duodenum, throughout the upper GI tract, including the retroperitoneal spaces, uh, including spaces all along the liver. So we're biopsying both left and right sides of the liver, or taking a look or even performing interventions with the gallbladder, uh, and so on. So it's really important to recognize these stations, and as you get trained on endoscopic ultrasound, uh, have a good ability to reconstruct these images in your head because oftentimes, again, we're completely desufflating all the air and looking only with endoscopic ultrasound. So does endoscopic ultrasound have an impact on malignancy? So we've talked about how we can stage and get really high definition detail of the walls of organs to be able to stage T1, T2, T3, T4 cancers uh, for the esophagus, stomach, rectum, uh, additionally, uh, for small bowel, early small bowel tumors and ampullary tumors and pancreatic cancers. But does the U.S. change management? So this is a nice study uh, that came out of GIE in 2004 when EUS was really starting to take off for staging of cancers. And what they wanted to do was take a look at 90 patients, take a look at referring oncologists, surgeons, pulmonologists, GI physicians, perform endoscopic ultrasound on patients for staging of cancers. And what they found through a myriad of cancers that were included across the 90 patients, that uh, there was a change or alteration in management plans in 51% of all patients who underwent endoscopic ultrasound, showing the impact of EUS on staging for cancers. And here's a breakdown of some of that. So management changes occurred in 12 to 22 patients for esophagus, uh, 9 of 15 for gastric, uh, 21 of 43 for pancreas, and 4 of 10 for uh, rectal endoscopic ultrasound. FNA also helps increase uh, the utility. And back then, they only had fine needle aspiration as opposed to fine needle biopsy, which we'll talk about in the next segment of the lecture. And so the transition to the second portion of the lectures, in this section, we're going to focus particularly on endoscopic fine needle aspiration versus endoscopic fine needle biopsy. This has truly been a paradigm change for us in endoscopic ultrasound, and it's changed the way in which we not only acquire tissue, but in the way that we perform a utility for oncologists in particular, as they're asking for more and more subspecialized testing, molecular medicine. Also, our pathologists have seen an increased yield in their ability to be able to define architecture and give us even more detail on the pathology side. So oftentimes we'll have pathologists say, well, this got an FNA from XYZ modality. It'd be great if we can get a big core sedimentary interventional endoscopist. So tissue acquisition was the big first change in uh, endoscopic ultrasound evolution. So first, we had only radial scopes with diagnostic capabilities uh, based upon imaging, but we're not able to perform tissue acquisition. Then the ones of linear scopes were invented kind of in the late 90s, um, they really took off. There was an opportunity to get tissue acquisition. And that originally came with needles such as this that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. Needles such as this uh, are as you can see, a design that's very similar to what you would use to start an IV. So they actually push tissue away and allow for puncturing into a solid or cystic object. 
And in doing so, they're pushing tissue away. So they're great for getting into a particular lesion, but perhaps not that great for getting a core of actual tissue out of a lesion. There's three different predominant sizes of these, of these needles, 19 gauge, 22 gauge, and 25 gauge. And these needles, um, after the linear echoendoscope was introduced, were originally used to grab cells. Cells indicate cytology. So what we're trying to do here is actually aspirate. So you'll see original studies looking at the value of adding suction to find needle aspiration, and then looking at suction versus a slow pullback of the stylet versus um, using liquid suction and so on. And the point there was, was to be able to aspirate cells out of a solid lesion or to aspirate fluid out of a, a fluid-filled lesion. So we still utilize these in our practice, uh, particularly for cysts, to be able to aspirate a fluid out of a cyst. However, uh, grabbing just singular cells out of a particular target means that you're limited to rubbing them onto a slide and having a cytopathologist look at individualized cells and trying to make a call. Once we take the remaining tissue, we put it all into a jar, we can put it into a centrifuge and spin it down until it creates a solid block of tissue called a cell block. However, the cell block does not have natural architecture. They're just all those leftover cells being spun down and being formed into kind of an artificial block, so to speak. Core biopsy then came about, and there were some, a variety of needles that were introduced. I won't mention necessarily the needle names or manufacturers, but you can see some of them listed here. All of these were the first attempt old methods in order to be able to uh, create uh, an ability for us to cut tissue out and get solid histology. So histology, as opposed to cytology, means you're keeping tissue architecture intact, and you're taking a chunk of tissue out of a target lesion. And here you can see some examples of some of those original uh, devices being used here on the right and using a cutting ability to cut some tissue out. And here's what you can see the difference is. So rather than rubbing some, some cells onto a slide and then taking a look on a slide, you actually can directly take tissue and place it into formalin, very similar to using forceps biopsies um, or snare where you're resecting a piece of tissue and putting it directly to formalin where the natural architecture is kept intact it can then be sectioned off uh, in the pathology lab, and they can take a closer look, and they can do that under the microscope, looking at the natural architecture and giving us more useful information. Great examples might be in such as lymphoma and some other uh, specialized cancer spaces, which I'll mention later. Here you can see the next genre of um, FNB needles. So here you can see different tips and this tip will be highlighted later on. This is a fork tip needle. There's also ones that have tri-tip or Fort Francine needles. And as these came about, these tips allowed for a cutting bevel on the very front edge of the needle. So while other ones have slots inside of them, so that when you pull back the needle, it would pull back and cut that way and absorb tissue in, these cut going forward. So you'd actually hit the lesion fast forward with this type of a fork tip edge that has actually eight different cutting surfaces on the front edge of this fork tip needle. And as it drives forward into tissue, it's cutting tissue out and driving it up into the shaft of the needle. As it does that, that then you pull that uh, cutting needle out and you actually have a solid uh, core of tissue that you're removing. And here you can see a little better demonstration of that. Here you can see a longer sharp access tip, the cutting heels, the center cutting lumen where tissue is coming back. And here again, you're seeing tissue acquisition and tissue biopsies. So as you go in with a standard needle, you would actually push tissue away because you're trying to get in with that type of needle that has a similar design to needles where you start IVs. This type of needle, you're actually cutting tissue in and it's actually grabbing tissue and driving it up into the needle in a more facile manner. So we were involved with the study. Uh, the study was first author was uh, Chris DeMeo and uh, out of Mount Sinai. Published it back in 2016 as some of these needles first came about. And it took a look across a multitude of institutions across the North America uh, at the utility of this novel model of this fork tip needle. 
And uh, additional data came about afterwards in this study that we worked on with uh, Linda Lee from Harvard and Jose Nieta. And essentially, very similar to the very first study, what we saw, saw was an increased yield in the ability to be able to get visible core biopsies that were utilized by pathologists to have a very high diagnostic yield. In order to further compare from the very first pilot study that you saw, we launched the second study. The second study actually took a look directly at FNA versus FNB. FNA using the old needles, trying to as aspirate some cells, create um, a, a slide with some cells for cytopathology to look at, and then putting it and spinning down a cell block versus actually taking out a core of specimen, touching it onto a slide, which is called a touch prep. So you're actually touching a couple of cells off. They're still getting a cytopathology read on site, but you're actually taking the entire core intact and dropping it into formalin. And in this study here, you can see some of the breakdown. Um, and we basically had 30 on the FNA side and 30 on the FNB side. Here's a breakdown of some of the characteristics. And what's really important to note is the number of passes that went down with the core biopsy needle. The actual time that it took to do the procedure went down with the core biopsy needle. The complication rates did not go up with the core biopsy needle. And so because it took less time, the overall charges actually went down as well. And so the value that we got out of that study was we were able to prove that fine needle biopsies have an increased yield than fine needle aspirate for being able to create an accurate diagnosis with less time and less number of passes, so less number of actual punctures into the target lesion um, and no increase in potential harm to the patient. I'm gonna use a case-based example. We'd like to break this lecture up. Uh, and so we're gonna use a case-based example here in the mediastinum. I mentioned that many of you may or may not be involved with mediastinal utilization of endoscopic ultrasound, so I thought this would be a great case to show the value of US guided core biopsies, particularly in the mediastinal space. We're gonna play the video and I'll walk you through. So this is an EUS guided mediastinal core biopsy. Sixty-seven-year-old female with past medical history of hypertension and lung cancer, status post right upper lobe lobectomy eight years ago, went to her primary care physician for weight loss. She had a CT scan that showed a large lymph node on the right side and a mass-like lesion in the subcranial space. She was referred for an EBUS, and the EBUS originally did not get good yield. Here you can see the endoscopic ultrasound. This is the radial scope that I told you about where it looks like a CT scan. What you're seeing is the heart beating on some of those images. You're seeing the aorta over here. You're seeing a lymph node over here. And this is the spine over here. Again, you're seeing the heart. I'm gonna pull up to the subcranial space. Here's the spine, here's the aorta. And this is the scope with the balloon around the scope. And here you can see this large mass pop up and I'm measuring the mass. You can see an additional large lymph node just above the mass on the radial scope. And now we're converting to the linear scope. We originally tried an FNA. We did not get back a great answer for this patient. So then we converted. We actually did a 22 gauge FNB and a 19 gauge FNB. Here's the example of the 19 gauge, the largest size needle FNB and you can see actually core biopsies from the mediastinal mass that we've obtained. We then did a touch prep on site. We were able to get an answer for the patient. Patient tolerated the procedure very well without any significant complications. And what we found was the patient actually had a recurrence of her original cancer. And there was actually expression of a molecular mutation that could be targeted so they're able to give a very specific chemotherapy for this patient. Uh, so getting those cores, we would not be able to do that with a cell block. Additionally, it was able to get us an answer for our patient. So what we're often doing, and I mentioned this before, is taking a core biopsy such as this, touching it onto a slide, which is called the touch prep, getting a rapid on-site evaluation, R-O-S-E, ROSE, rapid on-site evaluation from our cytopathologist by a touch prep method. So not smearing the cells, but actually touching it onto the slide, doing a uh, staining, getting an answer, and then leaving the rest of it intact in core and sending it directly off. This saves a lot of time, and it also keeps those specimens intact for appropriate histopathologic evaluation. 
Here's another uh, case-based example of the value of US core biopsy. So this is now in the pancreas. So this is a 35-year-old female with acute on chronic abdominal pain, intermittent pain for four years, a history of pancreatitis. She has a history of heavy alcohol use. She last used alcohol in 2012. She also has a history of drug abuse. Here you can see in the body of the pancreas, me measuring the pancreatic duct. It's 1.9 millimeters. Up to two millimeters is very acceptable for an individual of this age. So it's normal caliber. Here we're combing through the pancreas. And you can see this mass pop up, this hypochoic mass here. It's in the distal body of the pancreas. It measures 12 by 14 millimeters in size. It was called cystic on the MRI, but however, you can see here, it's quite solid. There's upstream dilation of the pancreatic duct because it's blocking the pancreatic duct, which is a concerning finding for potential malignancy. Again, on the MRI, they just saw a small cyst, not even measured of this size. CT scan did not pick up this lesion, um, which is not necessarily uncommon. Here you're seeing a puncture. It's a 22 gauge core biopsy needle. As we remove uh, the needle itself, we're able to keep the catheter in place. Here you can see the tip of the needle and that fork tip design. And here you can see the actual core biopsies. Touch prep was performed on this individual as well. They were able to call it at the first pass. And here you can see some stains from that tumor. And this patient also had nice intact large core for histology. And here you can see a synaptophysin stain, which gives you an idea that this is a neuroendocrine tumor. It's confirmed with the chromogran stain as well. So this patient had a 12 by 14 millimeter neuroendocrine tumor in the tail of the pancreas, had a low KI67 index. Uh, given the young age, uh, went for surgery, did very well with the surgery, and was completely resected. So this patient did excellent, and uh, this is, again, a great example of the utility of fine needle biopsy. So what lesions benefit from core biopsy? Well, here's a few of them. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, solid pseudopapillary neoplasms, autoimmune pancreatitis, lymphomas, which I mentioned before. The core has a true value here because it can tell you uh, the degree of aggression of the biology of the tumor. It can differentiate between a B, large B-cell uh, lymphoma versus another subtype of a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and has a real yield, especially if you're getting two centimeter cores. Uh, additionally, mass forming chronic pancreatitis, because sometimes it's difficult to differentiate that from a true adenocarcinoma, is great for metastasis, particularly if you're looking for molecular analysis type studies. It's also great for muscle-based tumors. Great example are gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Those are very tough tumors because they arise from the muscle. And just biopsying them with an FNA needle, sometimes you won't get enough cells. So it's great to actually take cores, you see spindle cells there, and then you're able to, to actually stain them and uh, stain them for stains such as dog one, where you can differentiate them from a benign lyoma and decide if the patient needs to have treatment. So thinking ahead, here are some of the personalized medicines that, uh, that we're asking for patients to get stained for from our medical oncology counterparts. And so when they're looking for this uh, personalized medicine staining, they're looking for particular expressions that allow them to give targeted therapies, and that can really only be done by intact histologic specimens. So in gastrointestinal stromal tumors in specific, that's a great example of, again, looking at FNA versus FNB. And we gave you a prior example of a study that I conducted, but this one's conducted uh, by Dr. Al Shafiq when he was a resident at Thomas Jefferson University. And essentially what they looked at was in a total of 106 patients, what's the value of a patient undergoing EUS or FNB for suspected gastrointestinal stromal tumors? Again, these are muscle-based tumors, and so they're very difficult to obtain cells from, from in the first place. But to do that, it's better to get a core of biopsy as opposed to just aspirating some cells, especially as those cells might not readily be available when they're attached to thick muscle fibers. And here you can see the conclusions where they use a fork tip type needle. You can see the differences in various needle sizes and the yield of FNA versus FNB, what the percentage yield is. 
And overall, in the composite, you can see that FNB is statistically significant in terms of having a greater value than FNA for core biopsies of gastrointestinal stromal tumors. So just summarizing here, what's the difference between EUS versus FNA versus EUS FNB? And it's important to get the nomenclature right. EUS FNA, it's an FNA needle. EUS FNB, it's a specifically designed FNB needle. The specimen, you have a visible core of specimen always on FNB. You may or may not on FNA. You're smearing those cells together for rapid on-site evaluation of particular cells. And then those smears and what's remaining fragments of cells are, are then dropped and spun informally into a cell block. For FNB, you're actually doing a touch prep for the rows, very much like the interventional radiologist. You're taking the core, trying to rub some cells off the core, and then dropping the rest straight to formalin. This, for, the specimen should not be spun around, so it's not put into a cell block. It's then the architecture is preserved, and you're looking at histology, not cytology. FNA, you're looking at cytology. You lose architecture on the cell block. USFNA often requires more passes. It's limited by need for only cytology and not having true histology. It needs a cell block. USFNB actually takes usually two to three passes. You don't necessarily have to have rapid on-site evaluation. Gastrointestinal tumors, small lesions less than one centimeter, need for immunohistochemical staining and lymphoma are great examples examples of areas where you may choose to use EUS FNB. Tips and tricks for EUS FNB before moving on to the next, next and last section. We often recommend if you're using a fork tip type needle to enter the lesion from the top of the lesion. It's rather easy to puncture with these sharp uh, FNB needles that are specifically designed for FNB. We recommend six to 10 actuations, usually it's six to eight actuations. It's okay to fan and you should fan and you're able to fan with FNB needles. Slowly pulling is what's preferred in our technique for FNB. So if you're using the fork tip type needle, you do not need to add suction. We looked at that originally in that Chris DeMeo study, adding suction versus not adding suction. We saw no value of adding suction, with the, particularly with the fork tip type needle. I'm not sure that necessarily trans, transitions over to the Francine tri-tip needle, but definitely for the fork tip needle. All the nurse is doing is some gentle back traction on the stylet. The stylet's moving backwards as there's more and more core coming into the top of the needle. You do not need to remove the entire stylet. In fact, after six to eight actuations up to 10, you'll actually find that the stylet's almost out, but not totally out, which is great because then you remove the needle itself and your nurse can just pass forward the stylet and go directly into formalin. A touch prep can be performed uh, for rapid onsite. None of this goes into cell block. What about for lymph nodes? We still use a slow pull method, but we alternate between RPMI, which is a special type of solution used for flow cytology, and dropping straight to formalin. Oftentimes, because we like to have large cores and we're worried about lymphoma, we want more architecture. We'll use a 19 gauge drop to the formalin for the large cores and a 22 gauge into RPMI because the RPMI actually is spun down and run through a flow cytometry machine. Also, what about benign liver biopsy? So this is very different than a metastatic lesion to the liver. A benign core liver biopsy is used for medical liver diagnosis. Let's say a patient has an indeterminate fibro scan and you're worried about them having NASH or advanced cirrhosis from steatohepatitis, or perhaps a patient has drug-induced liver disease, but you're not quite sure, and they have a dilated bile duct, and there may be some other etiologies, and so you want to differentiate you to liver biopsy. Well, this is done as a random core liver biopsy on the left and right sides of the liver. And there have been a number of studies uh, that have looked at potentially replacing IR for a core. So doing it in the same setting, doing an endoscopy if you need to do one anyway, and then combining EUS technology and actually getting a core specimen out, which actually can save some uh, time. It can save some pain for the patients because they can have pain from a percutaneous biopsy and perhaps even decrease costs if you're combining it with an endoscopy that's needed anyway. And a series of this work has really been pioneered through Dr. David Deal at Geisinger, so I'd be remiss to not give him credit. And here's some examples of some of the studies. So uh, this is one of the studies that uh, he helped conduct in 2014, and they basically looked at U.S. guided liver biopsy as a diagnostic sample versus percutaneous or transjugular IR-based routes. 
And in this study, they were able to take a look at 102 core, U.S. Low, core liver biopsies and compare them to percutaneous or transjugular. And you can see the length of the specimen, which is quite important. Um, you can also see the total number of complete portal tracts, which you need at least 11 to be diagnostic. And you can see that EOS clearly had superiority in terms of specimen acquisition, something that's not typically understood or known or accepted at a variety of centers, even large volume EOS centers. This is what benign core liver biopsy looks like. These are my own actual specimens, and you can see great visible cores that drop directly into formalin, um, and they can have a great yield for your patient and totally change the management of this benign liver disease. How do we do it? We actually use modified wet suction here, so we don't use the slow pull technique. Uh, what we mean by that is we actually flush five cc's of normal saline to prime the needle. You can use a tri-tip or a forcing, uh, a tri-tip forcing or a fork type needle here in these in these types. We then take three cc's of saline with 20 cc suction in the syringe. So three cc's is left in the chamber of the syringe. And we do three to five actuations. More recently, we've dropped down to three actuations. Uh, we try to stay away from going beyond four actuations. You can use a slow pull method. We actually have some data coming out right now looking at slow pull versus modified wet suction. Uh, we don't have that final data back from this study, so I'd be remiss to say you can or can't use slow pull. But our go-to technique is the modified wet suction technique at this time. There's also been reports of using the fork tip needle in a single pass, so just biopsying just once, doing a long throw, five to six centimeters. Um, that technique was actually published by Jose Nieto and uh, can be referenced and has some great yield and great value as well. And here's another, uh, that study that I mentioned with Jose Nieto looking at the single pass 19 gauge. Recently, there is some data that from Dr. Dia looking at what single pass versus three passes, uh, meaning going back in three actuations, and the three actuations seems to have more value. Um, perhaps more studies are required to really be able to make that assessment. So on to the last section of our lecture here, new frontiers in therapeutic endoscopic ultrasound. There are a variety of things that we're doing in endoscopic ultrasound now from things like endohepatology. I gave you examples with core biopsies for medical liver, also going into the portal vein and measuring portal pressures across the portal wedge pressure gradient in the liver. Those all fall under the realm of endohepatology. At our center, we also place fiducial markers for hepatocellular carcinoma for targeted SBRT therapy. Um, and we're also pursuing some EUS guided RFA technology for hepatocellular carcinoma ablation. Endoscopic guided biliary bypass. We will not have time to go through an entire video, but I'd be happy to share a video with you. You actually can use EUS to puncture the bile ducts when you're not able to go through the native ampulla, perhaps due to a stricture from cancer that does not allow you to access or get to the ampulla by uh, an ERCP scope. And you can actually create a biliary bypass um, by placing stents directly into the bile duct and biliary tree. EUS lumen apposition has been a big game changer for us. So essentially, this is using a um, type of fully covered stent that has two discs, one on each end. One disc opens into the target hollow viscous organ, uh, or perhaps that's, that organ is a lupus small bowel, and then it opens back into where the area of the echo endoscope is. So it can be used, utilized for gallbladder drainage, which I'll show you an example of. It can be utilized for EUS guided GJ bypass and a variety of other interventions. And then finally, in the oncology space, we're doing EUS radiofrequency ablation, as well as EUS guided FNI, fine needle injection, uh, directly into tumors to allow for uh, better treatment of tumors without as much collateral side effect as systemic therapy. And here you can see a list of a variety of these types of interventions, perhaps not all of them I'm able to mention here, um, and they will continue to expand because I truly believe that endoscopic ultrasound because of its ability to minimally invasively access a variety of target organs, what was typically done laparoscopically is now sometimes being looked at to be done in endoscopic ultrasound through a natural orifice approach without any open incisions. Here's an example of pseudocyst drainage. So this is the typical old way that we used to do it. We'd puncture into an area, we'd actually uh, dilate across the tract and then drop stents into an area, uh, allowing uh, pseudocyst to drain. 
we now actually will use this. So we'll actually puncture into an area, puncture into a large pseudocyst as you're seeing here under endoscopic ultrasound guidance. We'll actually drop this as that lumen opposing stent. So we'll open one side of the stent on the cyst, the other side into the lumen, in this case, the stomach, and allow for drainage of a pseudocyst that way. Celiac neurolysis, we actually perform these quite regularly as we're a large cancer institution. It allows us to actually drop direct alcohol into uh, a ganglion or into the celiac plexus, allowing us to decrease pain in patients with locally advanced pancreatic cancers. Here's an example of a probe that we utilize for ablation. It's a radio frequency ablation probe, and we actually can place that into organs. I did one a couple of weeks ago for a neuroendocrine tumor that was considered not resectable in the tail of the pancreas that the patient opted for. And we have studies going on with radio frequency ablation. Fiducial markers are another thing that we often will place. Uh, we'll place these allowing for SBRT, which is stereotactic body, body radiation therapy, which it has a major advantage for less number of treatments, higher intensity of treatments, and less collateral damage to surrounding vital structures. Here's an example of preloaded fiducials that can be utilized uh, through this device. They can come in 19 or 22 gauge format. Depends on how large of a fiducial marker you'd like to place. We often are using the 22 gauge fiducial markers. We can place them in a variety of organs. When we place the 22 gauge, you can see what the size of that actual fiducial is. These fiducials are actually cylindrical coils, they're gold, pure gold coils. Um, 19 gauge allows for a little larger of a fiducial to be placed, depending on the body habitus and location. Partnering with the radiation oncologist, we often will use the right size, and oftentimes that ends up being a 22 gauge. We can do that in real time. So if we know somebody has a non-resectable cancer, but it's not metastatic, we'll often place biopsy and then place the fiducials in the same setting. And here's a better example of what one of those fiducial markers look like. Each of these preloaded syringes comes with two fiducials. We usually will place four fiducials to allow for uh, better visualization when there's contouring being done by our SBRT machine to deliver high intensity radiation. So we often are using this for, in our practice for locally advanced or unresectable pancreatic cancer that's non-metastatic. If it does not respond to chemotherapy, then we'll get sometimes SBRT. Other sites that we're used, we have used on, we've actually placed fiducials in the esophagus. If it's a squamous cell carcinoma in particular, it's very difficult to image on CT scan or PET scan. We'll place fiducial markers so that our radiation oncologists know where to target. We've also placed an unresectable hepatocellular carcinoma where there's strong data for SBRT. We've placed it around the bile duct as well, um, or even in oligometastatic disease to the liver uh, that's not resectable in a patient perhaps that has metastatic rectal cell carcinoma. And here you can see the value. So conventional radiotherapy, the sessions last 15 to 30 minutes. These sessions last 15 to 20 with SBRT. It's usually six to seven weeks for conventional radiotherapy. Here it's five or fewer, so usually three to five treatments, much less side effect profile as well. Again, we don't have time today to show you US biliary bypass, but if you contact me, I'm happy to share some videos for you or give you a link to a, a website where I have a number of videos that are uploaded that are free for access to all. Last video that we'll be showing today is EUS guided gallbladder drainage, and I'll walk you through this case. EUS guided gallbladder drainage is a great example of how ultrasound is utilizing its technology to image uh, patients and perform minimally invasive therapies. So this is an 87 year old with chronic kidney disease, dementia, hypothyroidism. He also has cardiovascular disease. He has an elevated white blood cell count, right upper quadrant pain, all consistent with cholecystitis. These patients are always seen by our trauma surgery or other specialty surgery teams. And if they deem them non-resectable for cholecystectomy, the patients are referred to us. And here you can see that nice thick wall around the gallbladder. They're referred to us for the potential consideration of cholecystoduodenostomy, which is the connection of the gallbladder to the small bowel, um, or cholecystogastrostomy, we're connected to the stomach. After reviewing a multidisciplinary approach, with interventional endoscopy, trauma surgery, it was decided uh, to pursue US guided drainage of this gallbladder. So we do a standard upper endoscopy, make sure there's no ulcers, no defects in uh, the upper GI tract that would prohibit us from performing this procedure. Here you're seeing a large stone with sludge and, and gallbladder wall thickening on endoscopic ultrasound. And we're querying this area and you can see the stone shadowing here.
it's always important to complete a full evaluation of the compatibility system. By doing so, you know that there's not other things that you're missing, perhaps a carcinoma, or as there have been times I've seen actually defect in the gallbladder wall where it's a subtle gallbladder wall perforation, and obviously it's not appropriate in those settings uh, to perform the procedure. Now we have punctured the wall of the gallbladder with a cauterized 19 gauge needle and we're opening the inner disc of that lumen opposing stent. We're now gonna pull back on the wall of the gallbladder. Here you're seeing some of the thermal energy being transduced. You're seeing that disc opened up and now the gallbladder is pulled against the wall of the small bowel here. Now we're opening up the inner disc to the small bowel. Now we've created an artificial ostomy. This stent, which is fully covered, will stay in place approximately four to six weeks. Here you can see it under endoscopic ultrasound sitting in the gallbladder. The gallbladder will appropriately drain. Oftentimes, small stones and sludge will remove, will fall out on their own. Remember, the opening in this case is about 15 millimeters diameter, enough to almost drive a colonoscope through that area. And then afterwards, after about six weeks or so, we go back. The tract is fully formed and matured. We'll pull the axial stent out. Here you can see that stent in place. As we pull out that stent, that uh, lumen opposing stent, we will then go back through that tract and we could perform additional interventions such as destruction of stones or removal of stone fragments, so on and so forth. This patient did excellent and uh, diet was advanced and the patient was then sent home on a regular diet. We do not have time to talk about US RFA, but again, I'm happy to share videos with you and I showed you some examples through pictures. Additionally, something that we're forming at our center, along with Baylor, Cedar sinai and Texas Tech University, is nanoparticle injection for locally advanced pancreatic cancer. I hope this lecture gave you a great overview of the foundations of endoscopic ultrasound. It gave you a better insight into why we have incorporated fine needle biopsy and how it has a utility, particularly in today's space of cancer care, but in a variety of uh, care, including benign liver biopsy, and some of the interesting and new innovations that are coming out with endoscopic ultrasound that are allowing for minimally invasive surgical procedures to be performed. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Christina Day. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, for that uh, most informative presentation. Um, I'd like to tell everyone how to get their certificate of completion. Um, again, this has been approved for one contact hour for physicians and nurses. Um, so you can go to www.saxtesting.com forward slash INIT. Um, you will register at the site, complete the evaluation, um, and then upon successful completion, you'll be able to pr print your certificate of completion. The archive version of this um, webinar will be available um, on demand at www.initiatives-patientsafety.org. Um, an email will be sent to everyone here um, when it is available. And uh, again, the on-demand version is accredited for physicians and nurses. All right, um, now we will have a little bit of time for a few questions um, with Dr. Sharma. So let me take a peek and we will get started. Um, all right, Dr. Sharma, um, out of the many advances identified, what is the most important therapeutic advance in your opinion? I think for diagnostic space, the advent of fine needle biopsy has a, been a major game changer for us. And simply because we have to be able to keep up with the importance of doing molecular markers, specific stains, as I mentioned, and being able to capture tissue in, in its native architecture from a variety of spaces that may otherwise be difficult to get to. So that would be it in the diagnostic space. In the therapeutic space, it's really hard to say. I mean, it depends on the patient and what the need is. I think the lumen opposing stents that can be deployed through endoscopic ultrasound have been and will continue to be a game changer. I mentioned endoscopic ultrasound allowing for GJ bypass, which is gastrojejunal bypass. I also think um, there's a value there in draining the gallbladder that's still kind of untouched. And so that's really important. In the cancer space, there will continue to be strides around injection and ablation of tumors. Um, particularly as we see immunotherapies start to rise, we may be able to synergize or create an immune uptick uh, in terms of an immune supercharger, so to speak, that will allow for systemic therapies that are immune-based uh, to have more efficacy. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and what are your recommendations for physicians who would like to increase their confidence and skill level when performing EUS? Yeah, I think that there's a variety of avenues to do that, either through societies, um, 
ASGE, which is the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, has some interesting courses and offerings. Um, I think going to US-based uh, discussions and CME events. So there are some that are offered. Uh, Orlando Live is a great example of one uh, that I've been on faculty for before. I think that has value. Getting on and watching videos and obviously looking at textbooks. Um, I think when you go back to the basics, I think after you've had some exposure to EUS, it always helps to go back. I find for myself going back and looking back at videos or going back to some of the original textbooks, they have even more meaning to me. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and uh, one of our uh, attendees would like to know, does the transducer need to make physical contact with the wall of the lumen? Um, and if so, are the needles retractable? Yeah, great question. So what happens is we traditionally will um, deflate the entire organ itself. So that allows for contact with the wall of the organ. And sometimes that's not the target organ. So a great example is the pancreas. You know, we're, if we're imaging through the stomach or through the duodenum. We're deflating the stomach or duodenum. We're then pushing the transducer on the wall of the stomach or duodenum, looking through it at the pancreas. The needle goes forward and goes through the wall of the duodenum or stomach um, and goes directly into the target lesion in the pancreas, then comes back out and gets pulled up through the channel before the scope is pulled back. So it doesn't stay there. Great, thank you. Um, and can you speak to your partnership with pathology, any lessons learned or collaborative best practices that you'd like to share? Absolutely, I think you know having that partnership with pathology allows you to realize you know, what they're looking for in their eyes and their lens. And, and that's really important because the pathologist has to make the call at the end of the day. And so we combine with them in a couple of ways. Number one, when uh, they come for rapid onsite, we're giving good explanations to them. If for some reason you don't have rapid onsight, writing good explanations down in terms of the clinical context and what you see on endoscopic ultrasound onto the path sheet can be extremely valuable for them. We've also set up a series of lectures in the very beginning when we introduced this technology with the pathologist, which just creates a very common collegial environment uh, where people feel free to collaborate. So I think that's important. And then finally, um, understanding what the quality of your specimens are, asking the question. I think there's nothing wrong with asking them, hey, am I doing a good job? Are you getting what you need? How can I be better? How big are the specimens? That has been extremely valuable because it's changed our technique or made us look at, is our technique optimal? Great, thank you. Yes, that relationship definitely is important. Um, have you found a difference in tissue ac acquisition between the fork tip uh, FNB needle versus the others? Yeah, um, you know, we see a, a real value in terms of its ability to puncture with the fork tip needle. The Francine needle also can get you really good tissue. Some of the older models with slotted needles, in my personal experience, meaning like you puncture in, they have a little slit in them, and you pull back, they just don't seem to get as much tissue. Um, and tissue is really kind of the, the paramount in this, in this scenario. So I would say, you know, the fork tip is, our, is kind of our workhorse. Um, for a lot of our biopsies. In the liver, maybe for benign liver disease, we sometimes will use the, the Francine or tri-tip needle type, um, but those two are the ones that we're using the most. Great, thank you. Um, in which cases would you recommend an FNA over an FNB? Yeah, as was highlighted before, we still do FNA. I, I would be remiss to say we do zero FNA. We do FNA when we're looking at cystic lesions, so pancreatic cystic lesions, drainage of cystic lesions, FNA of a pancreatic cyst, uh, we, we do an FNA needle. Uh, there's really no reason for us to have to use an FNB needle. Some people have looked at FN being the wall. They saw a very high um, complication rate in some of the original studies. Um, so we use an FNA needle there. FNB, as I pointed out before, has a really good value for lymphomas, gastrointestinal stromal tumors. When you need large cores of tissue, like when you're doing medical liver biopsies, uh, I think those are all areas where it's very helpful. I think in the setting of chronic pancreatitis, getting more tissue where the tissue is very tough is very important because you're trying to differentiate autoimmune or pancreatic cancer. Those are great places. Um, lymphoma, which I may have mentioned before, uh, and so on. Great, thank you. And I know you may have touched on this, but um, just to reiterate this, what contraindications are there with an EUS uh, fine needle biopsy, if any? Yeah, I mean, I think the relevant co relative contraindications involve, uh, number one, are you able to put the patient to sleep? So working with anesthesia, we use anesthesia for all of our cases, and perhaps in some places people are using conscious sedation. 
the second big big thing is um, you know what the bleeding risk is to the patient and so just understanding uh, if they are on a blood thinner have they uh, held their blood thinner the appropriate amount of time I'm not talking about just aspirin I'm talking more so about the heavier blood thinners uh, direct platelet inhibitors or things like Coumadin in particular if they're on Coumadin is the INR greater than 1.5 Wonderful, thank you. Um, and we have time just for a couple more questions. Um, what are some keys for people looking to expand EUS in their practice, practice at their institution? I think things to understand are that your referrals can come from anywhere. Uh, they don't necessarily have to come from other GI physicians or other general surgeons. Uh, we get a lot of referrals that come from gynecologic oncology, pulmonology, other medical oncologists that are subspecialized, like breast medical subspecialized or um, lung medical subspecialized or uh, GU medical subspecialized, where they're finding nodes or other target organs uh, in areas that you might not think of. Most people are so keyed in on pancreatic or biliary EUS uh, they sometimes might lose sight of some of the other opportunities that are out there for utilization in the U.S. The other big thing is talking to the other specialties. So when we launched gallbladder drainage, for example, it was a series of conversations that occurred with trauma surgery. Just make sure they understand what we can offer and that we're not here to necessarily replace, but we're here to partner around the patient and utilize the novel technologies in a way that are appropriately indicated for people that otherwise uh, maybe don't fit the fold for surgery or they had to take risks that they didn't want to take. Um, so that's a great conversation to have. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I think we have uh, reached our time now. Um, so thank you, Dr. Sharma, and I will uh, turn it back over to Tracy. Thank, thank you, you Christina. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, for such a great, a great webinar today. We'd also like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. There will be a survey immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar, and you will be presented with the online survey. Please keep your web browser open, and we appreciate your feedback, as well as a CE certificate of completion. To obtain your CE credits, please visit www.saxtesting.com backslash INIT and register at the site and complete the evaluation. Again, we'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, and this concludes our webinar. We hope you have a great rest of your day.